So every week when the staff gathers for our weekly meeting, we meet in the staff room and there's a painting that uh, is looking down upon us. It's this painting. This is called The Peaceable Kingdom by a Quaker painter named Edward Hicks. It's become now one of the most famous paintings in the history of American art. Hicks was so fascinated by this scene from uh, the 11th chapter of Isaiah that he painted it over and over. He painted it 61 times. It's the scene of the lion and the lamb laying down together, the carnivore and the herbivore, and everything is at peace, and there's a little child. Back in the background, the settlers are talking to the Native Americans, and they're sharing food and working things out. The whole thing is a beautiful picture of peace. He was obsessed with it, and it became to be a symbol of his life. And we're going to talk in the sermon a little bit about how to interpret this and apply it to our own lives. Please join me for the call to worship displayed on your screen. We come to worship God, who has made us and knows us. We come to celebrate God's presence among us. We come to follow Jesus, who leads us to new life. We come with joy, knowing in Christ we have eternal life. We come to listen to the Holy Spirit, who brings us forth. May we enter this time of worship, knowing the Spirit is alive with us. Let us worship our God, Creator, Redeemer, and Savior. God of grace and mercy, you have called us beloved, but we have refused to believe it. You have called us to follow, but we have dragged our feet. You give us the promise of your gracious presence, but we forget to look for you until we're backed into a corner. You are all the strength we need, but we exhaust ourselves trying to be in charge. Deliver us from the depths of our despair, O God. Mend our broken hearts and defeated spirits. And teach us how to be your faithful disciples. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, with joy I declare to you that in Jesus Christ, God has forgiven you, God has loved you, God loves you now and will love you always. This is the good news that brings new life. Believe it, pass it on, and be in peace. As the school year begins, I'm really excited to tell you about our new Sunday School program, Digging into Foundations of Faith. We will be learning what it means to be a Christian by exploring the Bible and seeing what it reveals about who God is and how we see Him and how He sees us. We'll see how we fit into God's family and we will also learn how to live the Christian life. As we study core concepts of Christianity, we will enhance our relationship with Jesus. Until we can safely meet in person, I will be posting the lessons each week along with a talk about video, a craft, and a family activity page. You can find the link for these on our website, in the messenger, and in my weekly emails. You can contact me at leslie at piedmontchurch.org. I look forward to digging into Foundations of Faith with you and your children this year. Thank you. Let's join together now in prayer. O oh Lord our God, when we in awesome wonder consider all the things that you have made in this world, we consider ourselves privileged and blessed to live in it to live and move and have our being in this creation that you have made. So thank you, God. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your promise. Thank you for your persistent call to us to follow your son Jesus as best we can. Because right now, God, a lot of us, even as we give you grace, and mercy, and thanks for all the things that you have made, some of us, can feel awfully out of place these days in our world. Some of us fear 
disease. We fear whatever might happen to us or a loved one. And we also lift up those who are caring to try to alleviate pain and suffering for people. And we know that you are among us through the hands and feet and eyes and ears and the hearts and minds of those who are doing your work in this world. We give you thanks for working still to create the world that you would have us inhabit. Holy God, we do also give you thanks for what seems to be good news coming from the Middle East this week. Promise of peace and some fresh opportunity to reconcile people. We pray that peace will really take root there and here, both in our hearts and in our interactions as a people in this country. We pray for people who feel the urge, the necessity to strive for justice. We pray for people who feel the urgency and the need to keep moving forward in their own lives, as difficult as it can be these days, to make a living and to send their kids to school. Holy God, a lot of us are looking forward to that if we haven't sent our kids to school already. We pray that you will guide them, guide our teachers and parents and everybody involved in the incredibly important task of education, that we might do something good for our kids and through our kids for this world. And in a brief moment of silence, God, I invite all of us to come into a time of silent prayer to lift up those for whom we have special concern. Merciful God, we give you thanks. We give you praise for who you are, what you've done, what you promised to do, and what you're doing even right now, through us, in us, and in our world. And we come to you now and pray the words that our Lord Jesus Christ has taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture today comes from uh, the Old Testament book of Isaiah, and it's a prophecy of the time when the Messiah comes and peace uh, is brought to the earth. It's called the Peaceable Kingdom from chapter 11 in Isaiah. A shoot shall come out of the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze their young, and their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Amen. When my oldest daughter, Mackenzie, was in preschool, it was my job to drop her off in the morning which was pretty convenient because the preschool was at the Presbyterian church that I worked at in Miami. And I can remember one day uh, taking her to the preschool and they had arranged for a petting zoo to be set up in the courtyard. And um, this woman had come and she had put some wire mesh fence in a circle and some hay bales in it. She had a sign that said, The Little Farm. And in the circle, uh, they had uh, a sheep, two piglets, chickens, and a couple of ducks. And the kids were allowed to stick their hands in and pet the animals and to feed them. And they were all having a great time, except for this one little boy who was just standing there with kind of a frown and a pout on his face. And I asked him what was wrong. And he just said, where are the tigers? Well, I get that, you know, I get that. I mean, when I went to the circus when I was a kid, the best part of the whole thing was the wild cats, the big cats, the lions, and the tigers. I remember going to the um, Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus, and they had a lion tamer named Gunther Gebel Williams this German guy, and he was supposedly the most famous wild animal trainer in the world. And here he was in this cage with these lions, and all he had was a little black whip. And he would crack the whip, and he would yell at the lions and get them to move from one chair to another chair over there. And the, the announcer would, would say, Gunther Gebel Williams has over 500 stitches in his body from where the lions didn't do what he said. And so uh, here he is, he's doing all this great stuff, um, and he's the greatest wild animal trainer of all time. But even he couldn't pull off the scene that was in our scripture today. Twice in the book of Isaiah, we're given a picture of predators and their prey lying down beside each other in perfect peace. In Isaiah 11 and again in Isaiah 65, we read that when the Messiah comes, the wolf, the leopard, the bear, and the lion will lie down with the lamb, the calf, the goat, and the ox. The carnivores and the herbivores sitting together in peace. 
And the lion will eat straw like an ox, it says. And a child will play on the den of a deadly snake. When the Messiah comes, says the Lord, they will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain. What do we make of such a text? It'd be nice to take it literally. I mean, it'd be wonderful if in God's eternal reign of peace, all sorts of animals were there with none of them killing, none of them afraid. What if in paradise you could bury your face in the golden mane of a lion and pet him till he purred? What if goats are best friends with grizzlies in heaven and the lamb and the wolf have conversations while munching clover for breakfast? One of the questions that I've been asked over the years, very deep theological question that comes up, is do dogs go to heaven? And uh, I've studied a lot about this, and the answer is only if they don't chase cats. As long as they're cool with the cats, they can get into heaven. But they have to be able to get along. I've known animals worth sharing eternity with. Scripture even says that the final redemption is not just of humankind alone, but of all creation. But who knows what exactly that means? If God has plans for animals, they're secret to us, and the beasts themselves aren't saying a word. But as for these texts about the lion lying down with the lamb, they, want to do, they have more to do with us than a dream of a petting zoo. This vision is a poetic picture of the peace God will make in the world. It's the promise of radical transformations. This world's instruments and agents of death will be remade into instruments of God's peace. Swords will be beaten into plowshares, talon and claw transformed into human hands, nations no longer devouring each other, but feeding together on God's bounty. When the Messiah comes with power, there will be such peace, the Bible says. And yet it's so hard to get that vision in our heads in today's world. When so many fangs are bared, so many nations and factions within nations are growling and snapping at each other. Jesus warned us never to be naive about peace. He said that we'd be at each other's throats till the end. In such a world, it's hard to hope for much peace. In the 19th century America, there was a Quaker painter by the name of Edward Hicks. He was self-taught and his style was somewhat primitive, almost childish in nature, but he went on to paint one of the most famous paintings in American art history. Hicks was a Quaker and uh, he had come to America and, and in those days, in the early 1800s, there, there was this dream about that America was going to be different from Europe, that the old customs and the hatreds and the wars, that that was all going to be left behind, and that America was going to be this, this city, shining city on a hill, in which things were going to be different. But as the century went on, and that, and that was the hope and dream of Quakers like Edward Hicks, but as the century went on, and wars came to America, and there was conflict between Native Americans and the settlers, and, and, other, other, and the Civil War, and all these things that happened. Edward Hicks became more and more disillusioned. And it actually showed in his paintings. One of the amazing things is that he painted this scene of the peaceable kingdom 61 times. Some of you may be saying, hey, I've seen that painting in a museum. There's all kinds of museums all over the United States that have one of those copies of the Peaceable Kingdom. 61 times. He, painted, he was fascinated with this. Some of you may have seen his other painting. He has a famous one on Noah's Ark. But this was the one that really captured his mind and his heart. Over and over, he painted the scene of the animal's sitting together in peace. And in the background, there are Indians, Native Americans, and settlers, and they're, they're working out a deal. They're, they're talking to each other. They're, they're trading. 
and the whole scene, and with them there's a child, and the little child is safe, even though there's deadly snakes around. And the whole idea was, in his mind was that someday this is what the world would be like. This is what God will bring when the Messiah comes. But as Hicks's disillusionment grew, the animals, the carnivores in the paintings, grew fiercer and more ferocious. In the early paintings, the lion looks gentle and lovely, but in later ones, he is fierce and ferocious and angry. His attitude showed up in his artwork. You know, when he kept painting the vision to the end of his life, he confessed that he was never satisfied with any of the work that he had done on this. It's hard to trust ourselves with this vision when so many adversaries are so deadly. Woody Allen once said, yeah, the lion and the lamb shall lie down together, but the lamb ain't going to get much sleep. That's how it is. We know what that means. Christ has called us to pray for peace and to work for peace and to live as peaceably as we can as his people. But we know very well the peaceable kingdom has not come yet. And God wants it to come one day. Surely it will come. But in the meantime, as we pray and seek for that kingdom, we can look for the promise that it has for our us, for inside of us. For the existence of violence and rage isn't just the problem of the snarling political world, it's the problem of my own snarling heart, and your heart too. The great poet Carl Sandburg once wrote a poem called Wilderness, in which he said, There's a wolf in me, fangs pointed for tearing gashes. There's a fox in me, I nose in the dark night and take sleepers and eat them and hide the feathers. There's a fish in me, a baboon in me. There's an eagle in me and a mockingbird. Oh, I got a zoo. I got a menagerie inside my ribs, under my bony head under my red valve heart, and I am the keeper of the zoo. The first great work of God's Messiah is to come to the bloody zoo in me and you, and to teach the lion and the lamb to live together. Christ has come to tame and integrate and harmonize our many warring selves, and to create a self at peace. Remember how one day Jesus came to a man who was so crazy and self-destructive that they kept him chained up because he would hurt himself? And Jesus comes to him and says, what is your name? And he says, my name is Legion, for we are many. Because he was inhabited by many evil spirits. And Jesus, through his power, cast out those demons that had kept him so troubled and so self-destructive and he became at peace with himself. Jesus has the power to do that to this day with us, to come into our troubled hearts and to create wholeness and peace. The menagerie in each of us is different. In some of us, the angry lion is dominant. We tear at others. We tear at ourselves for reasons we don't fully understand. We lash out even at those we love. There's an untamed aggression in us, a raging hunger that destroys relationships. But in others of us, it is the passive lamb that is predominant. We're timid and afraid. We're never willing to roar, even when roaring is called for. We live like victims without the power and the courage and the lion-hearted love of Christ. But what the peace of God gives is the integration of all these together. The work of Christ is to take the aggression in us and to make it more peaceable and to take the gentle in us and to make it more brave. Which do you need? The gentling of the lion or the roaring of the lamb in you? It's both that Christ gives who makes the lion and the lamb 
live together in harmony. Carol Gilligan was a professor at Harvard University in the psychology department, and her specialty was the study of moral development, particularly in children. And she was very interested in the difference between how girls and boys uh, develop their morality in different ways. And uh, in one, uh, one of her books, she told the story of uh, a girl and a boy who were playing together. And the girl said, I know, let's play next door neighbors. And the boy says, no, I want to play pirates. So the girl says, oh, okay, well, you can be the pirate who lives next door. Well, most people will say, well, you can't do that. Those are two different games, neighbors and pirates. But I think the girl was on to something. She was on to something. Um, she said, you can be the pirate that lives next door. Many of us, especially us boys, might have said pirates and neighbors don't mix. Let's divide them and play pirates for a while and then neighbors for a while. But the girl was more creative. She suspected that a pirate would be transformed if he were also a neighbor and that a neighborhood might be richer if a pirate lived in it. This is the integrating way of God, the pirate in me and the neighbor in me, the lion in you and the lamb in you, are no longer split off and in conflict, but are brought together in a surprisingly creative relationship. How? If you ask how, I say, uh, it's not a strategy, a therapy, or a program, but it's a person. The answer is the deep friendship with the one that Scripture calls both the Lion of Judah and the Lamb of God. God's Messiah has come. His name is Jesus. And in his life, the Lion and the Lamb dwell together. One of our crimes against him is to make him one without the other. To some people, God is all lion, all strength and judgment and wrath. To others, God is all lamb, all gentle and meek and weak. But Jesus the Christ has shown us the face of God, the face of the lion and the lamb together. In the Chronicles of Narnia, C.S. Lewis wrote a character that was a lion called Aslan, who is Jesus Christ. He's the Christ character in the book. And one of the, one of the characters says of Aslan, he's wild, you know. He's not a tame lion. And at the same time, he's the gentlest lamb who cares for the weak, forgives all sin, who suffers in terrible silence, and for our sake, even goes to death like a lamb to the slaughter. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Brothers and sisters, the only way that I know to find peace is not through a program, not through a particular idea, but a person. It's a deep and abiding friendship with the one who is called the Lion of Judah and the Lamb of God. Amen. Lord God, you have given us everything, all we have and all we are. We praise you for all our loving gifts. And we bring to you now our gifts. We dedicate what we bring and all that we are to serve you in mission and ministry. May all that we do proclaim to the world your great love for all of creation. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, wherever you are, I remind you that you are a representative and ambassador of our Lord Jesus Christ. So live your lives in such a way that when people see you, they'll see Christ living in you. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and always hold you in the palm of his hand. Amen.